Okay, so let's continue. Next, we are going to have Teemu Erkola talking about Rust programming language. So please, let's give a round of applause for Teemu. Thanks, Rope. Yeah, Rust. Uh, first of all, as Rope already told you, I'm Teemu. Uh, this is my seventh year at GoFor. And I've been following Rust since about 2012 and actively using it for the last, I'd say, 18-ish months. I've dabbled it with it before, but uh, actively been using it for that long. So we have a quite a bit to go through here, so I'm just gonna jump to it. First of all, why you should care about Rust at all. And I think this is one of the quotes that uh, currently best uh, exemplifies uh, how it feels to use Rust. It's, I thought about if there was some uh, single feature or s a single thing about it or a few things that I could talk about here that would make you understand why I like the language. But there's not a single thing. Like you can't say about a person, there's this sh one single thing why I like about him, if, unless they're really shallow and there really just is that one thing. Uh, when you start using Rust, it can be a bit difficult to uh, get along with, but by the time you start feeling comfortable with it, you really don't want to let go anymore. And why is that? Another quote from Catherine West at Chucklefish. Rust is one of the few languages that really gives you a large amount of confidence that your parallel and concurrent code is anywhere near correct. And if you've ever written parallel or concurrent code, you know it's not that easy to get right. And if writing that kind of code in Rust fills you with confidence about your code, you can imagine what it's like to write regular code. It really does give you confidence that what you write really does what it should do in all cases. That there are no corner cases you don't know about. And this extends to other places. It, it extends to the code other people write that you use. When you take a library uh, in many languages and you ask yourself, is this mature? Can I use this? Can I depend on this? Well, when you use Rust and you take a new library, you know that everything that the language itself enforces is already taken care of by the library simply because it compiles. It gives you that much stronger guarantees about uh, the, the uh, solidity of the library. These are typical comments when you read about Rust. In the Stack Overflow uh, questionnaires uh, research, uh, typically Rust has been the most loved language of all for third year running. And I think it's because it makes you feel confident, it makes you feel that everything you do actually does what it's supposed to. And this is not something that many languages can even get close to. So what I'm going to do today, I didn't come up with any one thing I could tell you that makes all of that happen. No one can be told what Rust is about, you have to see it for yourself and all that jazz. So I'm just going to try and lower the barrier for you to try Rust for yourself. And to do that, what better way than to show you the code? And we're going to start off with Cargo, because that's the first tool you'll run into when you start using Rust. And Cargo is a package manager and it's a project manager and it's a test harness. It's quite a bit of stuff and we are going to create a new lib called cargo demo and it creates 
three files, uh, two files, cargo, toml, and a librs. rs is the Rust file suffix. And let's take a look at those. First, the cargo toml. It shows the general uh, dependencies and project structure, so there's not much there yet. And if we go to the uh, librs, we see that it actually wrote us a test already. And we can try that out by running cargo test. And yes, it works. Awesome. So, as I said, Cargo does quite a bit more. And say we are going to write a random number library. And we are going to have a function called, let's say it, random int that returns an i32, and it's a 4, of course. It's decided by a fair dice roll. There. And now we can say cargo.open. Which, which opens our documentation. We are already documenting our stuff. Though the... Huh. Oh. What's there? Uh, no, no, that was just about the opening. No. It's never used. Oh, right, it's not public. That's of course, yeah. Let's make the function public and the... There, better. Now we should be able to see it. There, there's our random int. Returns a random number. So we are already testing and documenting our library. Just out of the gate, no further uh, tools or anything necessary. But now we should maybe make that random number generation a bit better. So let's take a dependency. Oops. I'm trying to rush here. Oh. <laughs> and let's... Oh, right. Let's take that... Um, it would actually, um, yeah, I think I should compile so I can get the autofill there. Sorry, I haven't practiced this at all. <laughs> Didn't have time. And now it's fetching us the rand crate. Okay. And I have an unused import because I didn't use it yet. Okay, I think that should work. Yep, it works. And now I can make a test here. This is the only part I'm going to live code here, because there's a lot of code. Just let's try to get this one right. Uh, 
Uh, and I have a... Uh. Okay. Yes, it's built and... Let's test it. Okay, both tests go right in, but I'm not seeing. So let's do that. Okay, there we have our random number, the 58264, and it should be random each time. Yes, now we are generating random numbers. So already we have taken a new uh, dependency. We have created a new library that uh, has documentation, has testing, and everything. So Cargo does all this basic stuff for you, and it's pretty much, uh, it's, yeah, it is the standard way of doing Rust. So you get all of this for free. So let's get ahead. And now about the basics for Rust. I have some pre-done stuff. I have here a common library, and I have a bunch of stuff that depend on it. So, going to the basics... Let's see... Okay, this one didn't yet depend on it, so there's nothing fun there. Okay, uh, nothing there should pretty much be really complex for any of you, because you, ha you are, have done the same things in many other languages. There's a uh, numbers, numbers, uh, ty uh, types can be uh, inferred from expressions, so I don't always have to tell what type something is to use it, but everything is statically typed, so everything has a type. Uh, there's two kinds of strings. There's the kinds that you generally, uh, that are fixed size and generally uh, live not somewhere heap allocated or anything. And then there's own strings that you can pass around and generally use more. These are the kinds of strings you mostly just have in other languages. These are lower level stuff. Uh, then there's uh, options. It's similar to maybe type in some other languages. It can be none or it can be something. There's results that uh, uh, are used to uh, show if something succeeded or something went wrong. There's more about both of these later on. There's uh, static arrays. Uh, that's uh, three of 32-bit floats down there. I think I'll put it up so you can see it even in the back row. Yep. Then there's uh, vectors. And so, okay, I'll sh just show you running that particular piece. Yep. Okay, there's the two numbers, two strings, two options, two results, and two lists. Everything works as it should. Okay, these are j th these were just to get you a little acquainted into uh, that uh, syntax of Rust. They are nothing special, really. Uh, same with functions. You can have a function like section title that prints a new section title like we saw here there were the functions and references and closures and such or you can have something a bit more complicated this one here uh, takes a vector of integers and then it uh, takes a part of that and returns a new vector that contains those parts and if you see, saw my last Rust speech, uh, you know about the ownership model in Rust. If you haven't, I suggest you uh, go to our company YouTube account and see it. I talk about the ownership model a bit more there. 
but this means that uh, the vector here is used by this function. Once you give this function the vector, you can't use it again. It's owned by this function then. And then it returns ownership of a new vector that has the uh, part, the subvector of the one you gave it. So usually you, you don't want to do that. You want maybe to only view part of the vector or change part of the vector. And that's where references and slices come in. So you can borrow data to places. You don't have to give it to them. Uh, the, in this subvector uh, function, you actually give the data to the function and then it owns it. You don't have it anymore. You can't use it. So Rust has the uh, concept of borrowing. So you can borrow by giving a reference here. So now I'm giving a reference to the vector instead of uh, giving, o giving ownership of it. And then I'm returning what's called a slice. A slice is a uh, continuous piece of memory that contains one uh, zero or more of something. And it doesn't actually uh, specify the actual data, uh, actual the type of the uh, data type you are using. It's just a general slice. There's few of these over here. And it can be a vector, it can be an array, it can be something else. It's a simple abstraction. So here we are taking a slice indicated by uh, the brackets and the uh, double period there. So we're taking a slice from start to start dot len, uh, plus len and returning a reference to it. So now we have a uh, reference to a part of the to part of the vector without actually giving up the vector. This will come uh, more relevant a bit later. Then of course there's closures. Closures are anonymous functions. They look like this. And you can uh, use them, uh, for example, when mapping over a collection, like this, to get a vector of doubled these. And, or you can uh, capture variables, like here we, I capture the total, to sum the parts of it here. And now I do something funny because as you recall the subvector actually takes ownership of whatever I give it and I give it the doubles vector I've created up there and it returns a subvector of it okay as you saw earlier this works there's the closures uh, title there's the subvector but what if I try to run that again what happens? I've already given up ownership of the doubles vector. I can't give it there again. So let's try it. Let's try just doing this. Oh, I'm getting an error. Let's see what it is. So the compiler already noticed that I am using the function twice that takes ownership of something uh, something uh, in its environment. So I want you to think about that for, for a while. Uh, the compiler stops me from running a specific function twice. This is something that you generally do not have. You generally check this at runtime. If you don't want, say, some uh, action taken, you have, uh, say, you return a closure that does something to your system and you think that it should only be done once. 
Well, how do you do that? Well, generally you'd have to um, check that uh, when it's being run, that it isn't being run twice. But here, the compiler already tells us that you can't do this. It knows that you cannot take ownership of the same thing twice. So this is kind of a hint. This is, a, this is not the point here. This is just a... a what, what should I call it? <laughs> it's a coincidental feature of the ownership system. This stops you from making mistakes. Okay, let's make it compile again. There. And we're almost done with the basics. What time is it? Oh, I gotta get running. Okay, uh, I can have structured data, I can have uh, points, I can have lines. There's both over there. Okay. A line is something that goes from point to point, and a point is something that has an X and a Y. I can have enums. Enums in Rust are nice because they can contain data. You can say that amount can be actually zero, it can be about a few, it can be exactly something, it can be between things, it can be lots, or it can be all the things. So I can do uh, all these amounts. But now here comes the point. Say I you do a I do this. Uh, okay, now I want to get the three out of that exactly. So how would I do, th do that? How do I get the number out of there? Any ideas? No? Okay. Pattern matching. In Rust, pattern matching is pretty much everywhere. Okay. Uh, if I make a tuple, I can destruct it. That's a pattern. Uh, every assignment is a pattern. Okay. Uh, I can make a point, like I just uh, defined it, and then I can have in the uh, distance function, I can have destructuring here in the uh, function argument, that's a pattern. Then I can have an option that can be a point, or it cannot be a point, and then I can have a match expression that I can say that um, if the option there is some point that exactly has x0 and y0, it means it's right here. And if it's uh, some point with an x and y somewhere between minus 3 and 3, then it's nearby. And so on. And I can even have uh, forms here that check if it's one of the two or more. Or I can check that uh, I want uh, it to have an x equal to zero and y smaller than zero. I can make all kinds of uh, patterns here. Okay. Here I'm uh, just taking the point itself. If it's some point, I'll double P and Y, and in other case, it's none. But there's an easier way to do this. This is actually quite common. You want to do something to uh, some enum or option or something uh, in case it is some type and otherwise you just want to carry on. So there's an if let statement. So there's a pattern again. So if uh, the double option here is some x, where x is something, I can use the x here and just carry on. I can pattern match 
in an if statement to get something out of there. This is this is very convenient. It's kind of like um, uh, when you know you only want to do stuff when uh, your data is in some shape. And this right here, this match statement is when you want to uh, pick a path uh, in all cases. And there's also, uh, you can uh, pattern match in four statements. There I have a vector of, uh, of tuples, so I just pattern match the tuple here. Now, we've seen two types of patterns here. I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, some patterns, like let's say this one, what if the tuple did not have three parts? What would happen? Well, it can't happen. If I put here S and try to run this, it says an error because it's a different type. Okay, this is what's called an irrefutable pattern. It always works. It must always work. It's known at compile time that it always works. It always matches what is given to it. As a another case right here, the point might not always have x and y of 0. Or it might not even have a point. It might be none. So that's what's called a re refutable pattern. This is the basic distinction. And everything else is just refutable or if irrefutable patterns. And it's quite easy to see because here we have a, a, an, a refutable pattern because it can fail. And here we have an irrefutable pattern because it cannot fail. It's known at compile time that this will always work. Okay, let's move on. These are just the basic stuff to get out of the way, and then we will be out of time. Traits. They are kind of like interfaces, but they're not. Okay. At this point, we start using our common library, so let's open that up. There's quite a lot of stuff here. There's our point. We have a point that implements this uh, impl point, means that the point, the type itself, has these methods. And then there's a trait of magnitude that actually just uses that distance function. That's beside the point. Uh, so here I define that this trait uh, must implement, uh, to implement this trait, you must implement the magnitude function for it. And here I implement magnitude four point. Okay, simple this far. So now I can just say that the magnitude of the point is point dot magnitude. Okay, I guess I'll just show it. And right after this, we start getting to interesting parts. Okay, there's the point, and its magnitude is 7. Yes, it uses the Manhattan distance, so it just sums up the x and y parts. Okay, now what else can we do with traits? So, iterators are just traits. Okay, so I can create an iterator for these points of mine. So say I want to iterate over its uh, parts. I want to iterate over first x, then y, then nothing. So I create this struct to uh, own the point that it's iterating over and have a state for its enum, uh, enum for its state. And then I implement iterator for this. It's quite simple. So um, if the state is x, then it uh, sets its own state to y and returns some point, some uh, value of the point of x. 
if it's Y, it sets its state to done, and then it uh, sets uh, returns the value of Y, and if it's already done, then it returns none, which means the iterator is done. Okay? So, we already saw it in action, but here's how we just use it. So, now we can just save the point into iter and iterate over it. So, now we have an iterable thing. So, traits allow you to um, implement stuff to data from the outside. That's a stark contrast to uh, typical interface systems where you define which interfaces your data impl implements when you define the data itself. So this is, this is quite an uh, important desi design decision to have it uh, implementable from the outside. But what's important is that uh, you need to either own the trait you are implementing or the type you are implementing it for it needs to be in the same module, because if you could implement any trait for any type, then you'd quickly have stuff that, um, uh, that works depending on whether you happen to import some specific implementation for another thing, and it would go awry really fast. It seems uh, restricting at first, but basically, uh, you either have the type or you have the uh, trait you are implementing, and then you can make an implementation. But this really gets to where they shine when we start talking about generics. Wow, we are going fast. Okay, <laughs> the clock says I have three minutes left. Oh, that, yeah, right, five, okay. <sighs> Okay, let's see how much I can cram into this. Okay, generics. Uh, we already have something like this. Uh, now we are creating a vector of something. We are have we have an underscore there. We don't uh, something. You you decide. Okay, uh, the code can decide what the vector is of. Okay, then we have here some uh, pairs, some tuples that we convert with map into points, and then we collect them. Collect uh, creates a data structure from an iterator. And here the collect knows that the uh, point that, uh, it's, it contains points, the data structure, and the definition here says that it's a vector. So it can put one and one together. The one part of the data type that it creates comes from the data that it processes, and the other comes from the other end, uh, where it should be going. Think about that. That's type inference from two directions. It can, uh, this collect here, can infer that it should be a vector of points, even though I never say it is a vector of points. I say it is a vector of something, and then points come out the other end. So, yeah, it's a vector of points. This is still statically dedu deductible, okay? Deducible, yeah. Okay, uh, then I have, I'm trying to be as fast as I can to, get to cover generics at least. Okay, I've created here a, a type of iterator that uh, takes something, uh, okay, there, yes. Okay, uh, this takes an iterator and returns the first thing, but only if it's th it's the only thing. Otherwise, it just panics and blows up and crashes the application. This is not a good way to handle this, by the way. I would have told you what is a good way if I had time. But now, here, okay, we take the uh, first out of the iterator, then we try to get, to get another, and if it's something, then we panic, otherwise we return result. And now we say, well, okay, this applies to all iterators. Every iterator should implement this. We say generically, for any iterator, we can implement only iterable by just using the default. Okay, now every iterator in the world can use only. And here we are using it only, 
If I took this, it would crash. Not yet showing it now because we don't have time. Okay, and the other example here, I create another. This is in an iterator that only uh, iterates over unique elements. And here we are basically saying in the final row here that unique iteratable uh, is for any iterator where the uh, item being iterated over implements hash equals and clone. So now we have safely implemented a feature for every iterator out there without regarding uh, the type that it's being iterated over by just saying, well, okay, it works for everything, but it has to implement these things. This is incredibly powerful when you get to it, but it's still safe. It can't be misused. Okay, I think we don't, maybe. <laughs> oh, I don't think we have too much time anymore, unfortunately. Yeah, okay. So then uh, I think because the questions were afterwards, I'll just say my conclusions. Okay. Have you people seen this somewhere? Hero's Journey. Okay. Yes, some of you may have seen it. Okay, when I started using Rust, it was difficult. I faced many difficulties. Then I became a better human. And now I have come back to the regular world. And now I fear everything because it doesn't check all these things for me. Using Python after using Rust is terrible. I can't count on my code doing anything. I make it do because there are so many possible bugs that everything can have and it's not being checked it's f it's frightful okay so thank you <laughs> so any questions yep <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, when would you use Rust? In which kind of projects? Okay, uh, that's something I uh, answered in more in depth in the uh, other talk. But uh, at this time, uh, pretty much uh, everywhere except for pure front-end projects. The uh, web front-end uh, stuff, WebAssembly, is still kind of finding its place, and the uh, native UI stuff is still a bit not mature, but everything, server stuff, everything, uh, everything else, games, Chucklefish uses it for produ production games and su su such. I would use it pretty much for, pretty much for everything <laughs> right now. <laughs> so on the current project that you have, that you're working now, would you use it there? Uh, my current project, I would love to use it there, but there would be quite a bit to re-implement. <laughs> <I guess> so. <laughs> Yeah, actually, my question was about that. Uh, it, it is that uh, are you using Rust in uh, work projects? And no, <laughs> I hope I could use. Yes, and the question <laughs> is why? Or why? I mean, why not? Well, as I said, there would be so much to re-implement, and uh, the customer priorities are in new uh, features and doing uh, new business. Uh, what's those called? Business goals. Achieving business goals at this point. So doing a full rewrite in Rust isn't really feasible at this point. But if it was like some kind of microservice architecture, would you implement a new uh Yeah, sure. New service NPM has done that. They have a microservice architecture for their, uh, for their repository and they have been implementing uh, bits and pieces of it in Rust over time. Uh, anybody else in the company is using it in a, like in a yeah, work well, project? I think I know three people that are actively using Rust in this company. And to work projects. Uh, no, not to yeah, work projects. Yeah, exactly. No, actively yeah. using it in other capacities. But it's something that's rising quite steadily. So you might hear from it later more. Good. 
Uh, does Rust have any interop with other languages or transpilation or stuff like that? Yeah, um, it has a full foreign function interface uh, to interface with uh, anything that's compatible con compatible with C, for example. And it has quite a few runtimes for like Lua and Python and such, so you can use other languages with it. Uh, and of course, since it's uh, foreign function compatible with C, well, anything that's compatible, that's runnable with C, you can just make a Rust foreign function call to that library doing that. So it's quite compatible because of that. Uh, what do you think uh, will the best features will be uh, become available in other programming languages? And what about the ecosystem in uh, Rust? The ecosystem is quite vibrant. Uh, it's growing day by day. And uh, many, uh, many of the crates in the uh, package manager are more and more becoming stable and used in production. And the features coming to other languages, well, they mostly may very much depend on the ownership model. So unless that is ported, I don't see how they could be uh, made into other languages. And that would fundamentally change those other languages porting the ownership model. So I don't see how they actually could adopt them. Okay, so thank you. Unfortunately, I don't have a beer for you. You need to get it yourself. <laughs> so let's have a 10 minute break. And after that, we'll hear more about virtual reality. So let's give a round of applause for Teemu.